six months. Yeah, had a piece of my life. Yes. So, so really, it might be me. Because like, <laughs> she's working by reception class too. Yeah. Um, keep that on when you're ready to go. So, um, just a bit more, so I don't want it touching the necklace. If you touch the necklace, when I rattle. Shall I just take the necklace out? Yeah, well, yeah that would be better. Best, yeah. So it didn't. So it's bad. That's all right. Maybe one minute. I'm just. I don't even think I'll stay for that. Because I'm going to come on. Is this? Good. Yeah. Thank you. And then. When you're ready to start, I'll introduce you. So yeah. You wait a bit, or are you ready? Um. So I should be changing from here. Um, okay. If you, can you talk, if you stay around this space, that's what okay. I want to focus on. So with that as a backdrop, okay. uh, try not to go in front of the screen because then you become a silhouette and okay. do the rest here. Right. Um, you can change the slides with that, or you can yeah. go on your keyboard. It's up to you. Yeah. Uh, all right. Okay. Shall I? Shall I start? Well, hi everybody. Thank you for coming uh, to the SIDS seminar. This is the Center for Education and uh, International Development. This is actually our second seminar. Last week or so, we just had a, a major dissemination uh, meeting, which was actually part of uh, our seminar series. But we do have this seminar series as opportunity uh, for us to share our research, uh, invite uh, colleagues who do research internationally to come and share the research with you. So I'm glad and delighted that we have find time to come. Today I'm so pleased that we have my colleague here, uh, Dr. Laila uh, Kadiwao, uh, who is going to talk to us uh, about uh, in service uh, in service of dominant elites. The question mark there. 
nation education and peace building in post civil in bracket war Tajikistan. I mean, sounds very interesting topic, and I'm going to look forward to hearing uh, about her research. I, um, I just want to say a little bit about uh, uh, Dr. Laila Kadiwal. Uh, she's a specialist, uh, and in terms of her interest, um, her is in the focus of the role of youth <coughs> and teachers in conflict and peace building <coughs> in the global south and um, in the issues of education and conflict in Muslim context. Uh, she has carried our field work in a variety of uh, complex uh, contexts worldwide, including Tajikistan, Pakistan, UK, China, Dubai, quite a breadth of international scope in terms of her work. Uh, she is a sociologist by training, uh, <coughs> but most of her research uh, projects also apply into disciplinary nature in terms of mixed method. Um, she's worked uh, as a development practitioner, as a teacher, as a youth educator in India for more than 15 years before <coughs> moving to the UK and has taught uh, briefly in Pakistan as a civic uh, studies teacher. Um, she studied in Oxford, and she's also, she got her uh, uh, DPhil uh, from University uh, of Sussex. And today's research is really interesting because uh, it's part of research that spans three years involving in-depth interviews and focus groups with 21 trainee teachers from 13 different countries. So really rich study, and uh, I can't say more. I want to hear more from uh, the researcher herself, and so uh, my colleague, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. <coughs> um, I, I really would like to thank all of you for joining today because this discussion is uh, is is uh, I, I would like to raise some really uh, 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 some of the issues that are uh, important to me, but I also think are important to us uh, more generally, and. Um, and although it's focused on Tajikistan, I am mainly using Tajikistan as a case study to, to engage with each other in much broader inquiry about what do we mean by development itself and, 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 and for whom and, and for what purposes and whose interest does it serve. And uh, my uh, presentation is divided into three key parts. The first part, I would like to map uh, some uh, major discourses of development. So there are some hegemonic discourses which are very widespread, very predominant. They inform policies uh, uh, a great deal. But at the same time, uh, there are counter hegemonic discourses that challenge some of the assumptions of the dominant discourses. So I would like to map them. And I would like to propose argument that development education is actually a form of imperialism and is actually a driver of violence. And uh, my argument to large extent is informed by uh, disco discussions uh, from many different authors, but one particular author that I would like to really uh, in some way acknowledge is Edward Said, uh, Culture and Imperialism. It's a brilliant book and a lot, all, all his work is, is my inspiration. Uh, that would be my first part. The second part I would like to discuss. Now for me, it's very important where we start history from. Wherever we start history from is a political position. It includes something, it excludes something. And it gives very different interpretations depending on where we start history from. So for me, it's important to see things uh, as pattern. So imperialism has much wider pattern, much deeper pattern, and it constitutes it in much deeper ways. So I would like to raise some historical pattern of imperialism and how with different power, different notions of education and, and refinement, the ideas of somehow the powerful actors are coming to you to, to elevate you to a next level of civilization. So. So the idea, to I, I need to trace that historically. So that's what I'm going to do. Also, uh, while the first provides much wider context of the US-led discourses of development, I think some of us might be interested in the US history, uh, sorry, Soviet history, the how did the Soviet Union interact with its own discourse of education and development. So I thought I would add that. So this will serve more or less as a historical backdrop to our discussion. And the war in Afghanistan, I would like to situate it as, as, as a pivotal turning point where the Cold War uh, took a different shape. 
And the third uh, part will focus on Tajikistan today. So as I said, Tajikistan is just a case study, but my purpose is to open up much wider discussion here for my own learning, uh, my own growth as a student here. Uh, and I would like to focus on what are the interconnections between the offshore economy, development, the role of development actors, what are the interconnections and how they, when, when you include this, how does the development discourse look like? That's my question. The authoritarianism, so we, we've been talking about the rise of authoritarian nation state. How does it look like in Tajikistan? Nationalism, how is it connected with not actually being very nationalistic, narrow, but actually how it is connected with wider geopolitical interests? And, and then, so this focuses much on historical, much wider development discourse, much more global, lo national. But then I would like to take an example of a faith-based organization and see how do they negotiate the discourses locally with people, really as, as front level uh, mediators, uh, and then people themselves. How do they constitute themselves within these discourses, hegemonic as well as counter-hegemonic discourses? So that's the sort of inquiry I would like us to, uh, to engage in. Does that sound OK so far? Yeah? Now, uh, very quickly, sometimes people ask me, where is, where is Tajikistan? So very quickly. Uh, Tajikistan is here. It's a very small country, about 9 million people, which is uh, one of the uh, you know, lower end populations. Uh, but it also borders China, Afghanistan, parts of India, Pakistan. All of these areas are conflict affected. So Tajikistan, so my focus is here, uh, populations that are based here which were divided in the buffer game uh, in the bu as a buffer zone between US, uh, sorry, between British and uh, Russian empires. So you have Shenzhen, uh, some of them live in Shenzhen, some of them have been divided into Kashmir, some of them uh, have been divided into Pakistan. So it's a region that has been conflict affected for a very long time. Um, and that's called Gorno Badakhshan, that's the focus of my study. and. Uh, in Soviet Union, this is where Tajikistan is. That's where Moscow is. So you can see its core peripheral position. Uh, these are the uh, kind of uh, ta uh, areas where I went to. Uh, so Korog is here. And that's where my study is situated. And this is the larger. So it occupies 45% land area of the country, but only 3% population of the country. So it's a huge area, but a really small population uh, compared to the rest. OK, so what is my objective? A specific objective, as I said, I would like to see what are the dominant conceptions of education, development, and peace in Tajikistan? Whose interests do they serve? What implications do they have for, for social cohesion and long-term peace building? <clears throat> but my broader question is, why has development been so widely discussed in the 20th century? What has been said about it? What are the effects of power generated by what is said? Now, these questions I borrow literally from Foucault. He looked at, applied this way of thinking to sexuality. The, how did sexuality come to be constituted as an object of discussion itself? Does it make sense? Right? So, so how do we come to think about it? Uh, who gains from it? Who doesn't? What's hidden? Who benefits? So I would like to apply a similar way of thinking about development. In that sense, I'm drawing a lot on Foucault's idea of discourse. I would like, a, like the way I understand this concept is it's, it's a dominant language of interpretation. It's dominant language paradigm, which structures how we think. It structures how we relate to ourselves. It structures how we actually see us ourselves, how we constitute the other, how we uh, relate to the world around us. But then this 
language of interpretation, not everybody's language of interpretation become dominant language paradigm or dominant paradigm. So there is a notion of power here, that whose language, right? So whose language become, uh, becomes a dominant language to look at the world, to look at ourselves, to look at our relationships. So the dominant groups use institutions like education, religion, legal systems, art, literature, various institutions and systems of society that they control to ensure that their version prevails. Their version becomes normalized. And it gets normalized through offense, punishment, rewards, even violence, even through uh, fascinating uh, offers. But ultimate objective is to create docile subjectivities towards the dominant uh, elite. So this is my understanding of the hegemonic discourses. That's what they do. They keep the elite in power. It sustains their power. But resistance destabilizes taken for granted ideas and notions and ways of thinking. And it reveals the way dominant discourses marginalizes other ways of being and other ways of thinking. So this way of thinking is called post-structuralism. And post-colonial ideas and post-development ideas have taken a lot from this way of thinking. And that's what I'm going to draw upon. OK, so I thought I just wanted to spend some time uh, to just set my theoretical framework clearly, because I'll be dry, drawing upon it heavily. Now let's look at, now I would like to map what are the dominant discourses of development, education, and peace. As I understand, <clears throat> the entrepreneurial discourses really are widespread, very hegemonic. They've been given institutional weight by the USA, World Bank, IMF, just after the Second World War. Uh, it emerged. Liberal humanist positions, again, got institutional weight in 1945 through the establishment of the United Nations. And resistance discourses, counter discourses, interact with them. Yeah? They emerge from many different intellectual, ethical, and political commitments. But I would like to highlight that you know, these are not binaries. I wouldn't see them as binaries. I wouldn't even see them as continuums. So I wouldn't push, put them in one linear line. But they interact. They exist in relation to each other. In that discussion, conversation, they get constituted. I wouldn't also say that one is oppressive and the other is transformative, as some scholars or authors tend to do, call one type of discourses as transformative and the other as somehow non-transformative. I wouldn't want to do that because this experiences are subjective and contextual. And even uh, it, they can be both. They can be none. So it's very subjective experience for in a very micro context. And actors, academic actors themselves, uh, contextually move around these discourses. But for analytical purposes, I do want to distinguish. And they, get, do, they can be distinguished. Now, entrepreneurial discourse. Now, I'll go very quickly over this, because I, I have in front of me my mentors and scholars from whom I learned these things. So my objective is not to teach them what I've learned from them. So OK, so entrepreneurial discourse, very quickly. It's the US. You have Truman, uh, the US president, announcing a very bold program for, for, for the whole of humanity that would listen to the USA. That there is scientific advances and industrial progress. That's the idea of progress that they would give to underdeveloped areas. So this is developed. Somebody is underdeveloped that could benefit from the US. And the poverty is, uh, first of all, they're portrayed as poor. This is half of humanity it's talking about in the full speech. And is a handicap and a threat. Now, the idea of peace here is also connected with threat, that there is a humanity which is underdeveloped. It could be a threat to themselves and to more prosperous area. And therefore, 
it's a plan of development that we need to initiate. Now, there are some grand proclamations like there is no intentions of foreign profit exploitation in our plan. It's about democratic fair dealing. It's about constructive program. It's about better use of world's human and natural resources. So there is a plan of development which privileges capitalism, which talks about cultural explanation that people are poor because of their attitudes, their values, their, uh, their skill deficit, and therefore human develop, uh, capital development. From dark to light kind of linear view. Uh, it's universal vision. Everybody can uh, have that, should have that vision of development. It elevates the role of the US. OK, liberal humanist discourses have uh, received institutional weight through United Nations. And of course, it is also concerned with peace, because two world wars, it's concerned with peace, it's concerned with human rights. It's very clearly, and for these ends, so if you want peace, what you need to do is learn tolerance, learn to live together, being good neighbors. Uh, so liberal humanist discourses clearly privilege being good neighbors, learn learning tolerance as a way to build peace. So you have entrepreneurial discourse for which way to build peace is capitalism and economic growth. For liberal humanist position, peace is like working for common interests, being good neighbors, learning tolerance for each other. Again, it's also embedded in that modernization discourse that ancient should be scrapped etc cetera, etc cetera. <clears throat> now counter discourses the resistance discourses question now the voice that is pretending to be neutral scientific altruistic is not so it does not serve universal interest so this is the line of inquiry which post structural post colonial post development uh, writers tend to take now, I would like to unpack this argument that development as an imperial outreach strategy to preserve and extend the empire without much resistance. Now, what Said argues in culture and imperialism, what we need to keep in mind, we need to bring that historical context in when talking about development, that what was the context in which this liberal humanist positions and these entrepreneurial positions were being elevated by the US and other Western allies. We need to note that. Now by 20th century, already most of the rich Western power had access to, had already, already they were governing 85% of the land and resources and people. So it was already normalized that you can actually govern people elsewhere. And this hold was sustained not only by political, economic, and military might, but also through cultural discourse. Yeah? And it was a normalized view that other were inferior and destined to be governed and civilized by the colonizers. And it is within these normalized assumptions the whole discourse of development was built. <coughs> so the idea of USA talking about that we are here to bring democracy was already there in the USA, very deeply rooted in hegemony dis hegemonic discourses. But then what's not in the picture often in talking about development is other kind of discussions happening in the USA, in security front, in foreign policy front, where sentiments like this that, OK, it's a context of the Cold War. 100 plus countries want to decolonize. We need to devise a new pattern of relationship with these decolonizing countries in ways that we can sustain our hold and our interests. We cannot fail to be the object of envy and resentment. Our real task is to devise a pattern of relationship which will permit us to maintain this position of disparity. And Rostow, who is one of the famous or 
infamous academic who came up with five stages of growth where traditional society moves to high mass consumption society and therefore developed society. He actually acknowledges in his speech that we believe that given the Cold War and the global struggle for power, we believe that a portion of academic talent should be devoted to actually generating these new concepts. Uh, and then major international development institutions, agency, governments around the world were given generous funding to normalize this vision of development. But actually what happened? Now a lot of authors argue that peacekeeping in the common interest, the aspirations highlighted in the UN document, were actually re had resulted into militarization of civilian life. Arms sales were prioritized over investment on well-being and freedom everywhere. Aid has been geared towards serving their donors' interests rather than interest of the people. It also created unchallenged network of military power across the world. And what education did, instead of normalizing political activism, freedom, what it did was actually glorified military heroes and militarization. So a prominence of military in education, in nation disco building discourses, and, uh, and arms cell became important. Economic modern, mod modernization was presented as growth, but actually it helped towards retaining control over resources, market, and population by the erstwhile uh, rich uh, powers. Poverty, hunger, and literacy also, as Amin uh, argues in his work, that they became lucrative industries for planner and uh, experts. Schools selectively funded and structured. So even schools, modern schools were not egalitarianly spread out across the nations. They actually were planned and pre uh, given in ways that sustained the interest of the elite. And even the policies, the way they work of privatization, it uh, created issues for people. So military prominence, economic growth actually meant something else. Political modernization, where it talks about freedom and democracy, basically meant retaining compliant regimes. And aid was given, dictators were nurtured. The US armies actually protected uh, whoever supported US interest and its allies' interest, undermined the labor union, progressive social movements, rights of minorities and women's rights, and the schools played in this uh, wider picture uh, as instilling loyalty and docility towards the no nation rather than political uh, activist role. And social mo modernization, uh, scholars argue that the elites of the decolonizing nations retained their, uh, their erstwhile colonial powers, uh, languages, their knowledges, uh, generated that as a soft of power. That love for the West uh, was a soft strategy. And instead of talking about normalizing our very, very interconnected, very hybrid uh, identities, uh, they promoted essentialized identities. Now all this, the wider critique of, uh, of coming from counter-hegemonic discourses is that these dominant discourses do not address root causes of problems. Actually poverty is produced by the elite powers and liberal humanist positions promote charity rather than a fundamental transformation. The crit another critic is depoliticized orientation. Another critic is historical think uh, historical thinking, cultural explanations that colonization as if have nothing to do with uh, with with poverty created elsewhere, or and also people were poor because uh, they didn't have the right skills, they didn't have the right knowledge. Uh, invisibilizes violence. Ethnocentric projections, so it pre presented the humanity of governing elites and the West as superior, universal, and humanity of the other is to be suspected, monitored, projected as underdeveloped and inferior. Paternalistic relationship, that the powerful and wealthy countries are reaching out and humanitarian zeal to help the world. 
and bring them from dark to light. And, and that undermines that communities are capable of imagining their own solutions and their own futures. And now more recently, the scholars argue uh, the discourse of new imperialism and global governmentality, which is investments, there is increasing investment in stereotyping industry, various types of stereotypes. Peaceful country, not peaceful country, where, uh, where is everybody on PISA, where is everybody on gender, where is everybody on this and that. So ever-growing body of new concepts and sub-concepts to map, measure, and govern the world, which is a form of new imperialism and new global governmentality. So my argument is development is a refined cultural discourse that works alongside economic, military, and political agendas to sustain the Western hegemony and serves to the advantage of elites in both the global north and the south. And evidence also shows uh, in, uh, across the world that how flow of wealth uh, has not been quite egalitarian. So then I'm drawing upon my other wider body of, um, uh, of literature written by colleagues who write on peace building and education, like the Jindra, uh, Ferrali, Dr. Tejendra Ferrali, who's sitting here, Mario Novelli, and uh, Alan Smith, and other colleagues, that the dominant notions of education development are drivers of violence and armed conflict. A, they hide direct uh, violence, and they also perpetuate direct violence. They promote structural violence, where social, political, economic inequities uh, grow. And cultural violence, where cultural elements are used to then mask structural and direct violence. And therefore, <coughs> it renders violence as acceptable in society. And therefore, dominant discourses of peace try to talk about, oh, security. If we have security, it will be peace. If there is stability, there will be peace. If everybody learn to tolerate each other, it will be peace. Learn to live together, then it's peace. And if people have skill, people have resilience, people have lifelong learning, all that will produce peace. But my colleague argued that we need to address the root causes of inequities and conflict. Instead of cultural explanation, peace building discourses highlight structural explanations and root causes of here, World Bank documents and et cetera, et cetera, solution to, to conflict and uh, peace building is we need more data, we need better communication, you need effective communication with policy maker, give better policy options, don't talk about policy, you need to do this, give them options, more efficiency, more modernity, more education, et cetera, et cetera. But political accountability for doing justice is, uh, is what many of the colleagues are arguing. OK, so I mapped discourses of development uh, using imperial, uh, imperialism as one of my analytic, analytical framework. Now, I would like to look at the historical patterns of imperialism so that even that becomes more understandable in light of wider history. And then we will trace very uh, quickly the Soviet uh, side. OK, so I'll use Tajikistan as a case study. Now, Tajikistan historically has been um, part of Silk Road trading network for a for very, very long time. That did not only bring together traders and musicians and artists and scholars and philosophers and scientists, but it also brought together soldiers and conquest. And with each conquest, we can see the relationship between power and knowledge production. Power and the discourse, dominant discourse of education. I will very quickly run through this. Even if you go only 1,000 years, you see the discursive nature of knowledge production and the discourse of education, which keeps changing. OK, so legitimation strategy, when the Arab kingdoms emerged as major powers uh, from 8th century onwards. And this, they had widespread network built with the local elites. It was associated with trade, conquest, and up, uh, upper hand. 
What was the legitimation strategy of various Arab kingdoms? I am the true custodian of faith, right? I am bringing. So the idea that the more powerful ruler was bringing something to people to elevate them to the next level, yeah? Something more refining, some bringing more refinement there. And, and the legitimacy is drawn in relation to the uh, ideas of God. So the differences we find uh, within Islam are also connected with differences in loyalty. That which ruler did you give loyalty to? Because they have different language of interpretation to justify uh, the authority. But when Tsar came in 1853, the discourse was we're bringing modernity and we are bringing civilization. When the Soviet Union came, the discourse was we're bringing justice. We are actually post-colonial. <coughs> We're throwing away colonization of Tsar. We're bringing justice and emancipation and equality. And we are actually elder brothers. And we are the leading nations. Education, when the Arab kingdoms were at its height, they funded education, network of education and, and madrasas, which taught jurisprudence, logic, and philosophy, mathematics, physics. But they were more geared to serving, towards serving the elite interest. And they were also towards soft power, because they introduced Arabic alphabet, Arabic, Arabic, Turkic, Persian literature. So all these things serve as soft power. When Tsar came, that actually changed the hegemonic discourse. Now, madrasa and maktaba, instead of being uh, seen as valuable, they began to be seen as subversive, and as backward, and as outdated. And therefore, modern education was actually bringing civilization. And when the Soviet Union came, it talked about, now it brought about economically being useful. It brought about the ideas of serving the nation. So you see the shift happening. He is serving the religion, serving the, uh, uh, being modern, being, uh, serving the Soviet uh, nation. And in each sense, language and uh, literature and education becomes part of the soft power. Teachers, privileged, Arabo persian centric teachers were privileged. So teachers from local areas would travel to Arab kingdoms to learn enlightenment of that time, knowledge of that time, and bring it back. Um, so you see similar when it comes to the Soviet, the correct interpretation was available only by the Soviet teacher now. And the only leader worth emulating was at So you can see the ideological shifts taking place. Gorno Badakshan. Now, what is the situation of Gorno Badakshan that I went to study? How discourses constitute identity, right? So, those who gave loyalty to an Arab North African ruler kingdom in alliance with their local indigenous elite, they came to be uh, came to be formed part of a Shia Muslim community, right? They they became Shia, but Shia was a minority. So, when the Arab North uh, African rulers power uh, waned, the power of the local elite also waned, and they started being persecuted over the issue of loyalty. So the differences that we see in Shia, Sunni, and all these diverse communities is not associated with theology, but it's also associated with who did you give loyalty to. And, and, and that's where they move to the very isolated high up Pamir Mountains, and, that, and because they were Pamir mountains, they came to be called the Pamiris. So identities, so now it's seen as ethnic group, but this ethnic group emerges through historical contingency. When Tsar came, initially they were enthusiastic, as they were enthusiastic here to accept the North, uh, Arab North African ruler, they were enthusiastic to receive Tsar because Many of the elites won't change. Many of the people in local area won't change because something about the elite rule is not serving. So you see that wanting change and then supporting, so Jadidi's modernist movement emerge. But uh, of course, it also led to grievances and disappointment because the imperialism is not about working for people. If it was, it wouldn't be imperialism. And Soviet Union, again, initially very enthusiastic. So you have Pamiri elites actually supporting becoming socialist. We have socialist interpretation of Islam. We will be about e egalitarianism, uh, justice. 
And that's when their identity as Soviet citizen and Tajik nation gets constituted. OK, so what I tried to do very briefly is to give a sense of a long history to say how the idea of bringing something better to local people is connected with power and their discourses. Now I'll run through very quickly here. OK, the Soviet, you see diff uh, discursive element here. In the beginning, very actively Soviet Bolshevik revolutionary worked with different uh, grievances and their legitimation strategies uh, invested heavily uh, on uh, on in schools and powerhouses and all those development industrialization but they also by 1930s became militant Soviet atheism where you have to win community uh, you have to break the communities and a lot and and children should be completely taken over by the Soviet to mold in the way the Soviet wanted them to be molded. And the message of God was to be replaced by the message of facts. Doctrine of Marxism, Leninism was supposed to be the new reference point. And, uh, and they also invented nations. So, Tajik, uh, so that area of Tajikistan got cowed out as a nation. Many such nations got created uh, as progress. But these were really, scholars argue that these were not nations because people saw themselves in that coherent ways as Tajik, as Uzbek, as Kazakh. These were docile boxes that Soviet put together in non-threatening ways. So they chose folklores, history, stories that were non-threatening to the dominant power. Pictures and ideas of how US vision of freedom was actually not so, and how people are happy. OK, 1980s. 1980s, uh, now all this, we, we have the backdrop of the Cold War. The turning point is here. The revolution in Iran, I'm going to take some background knowledge uh, for granted that the American hegemony of Shah ended with 79 revolution. So America and Britain lost their control over oil resources now. And so you, 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 you lost power there. And then you have Soviet Union actually all the way in Afghanistan. So the battle, the Cold War, as scholars argue, was never fought in Russia or in America. It was always fought in all those countries perceived as in the mission, you know, in the need of development. So the US had funded and published jihadi textbooks. CIA, CIA and ISI, which is Pakistan's uh, intelligence, they smuggled these books into Afghanistan. And the US and Saudi channeled hundreds of millions of dollars uh, uh, and volunteers to support Mujahideen fighters. That's how Osama bin Laden got recruited. And this is the kind of uh, thing that refugee uh, displaced uh, children and adults uh, were supposed to learn uh, to overthrow communism. And this book was funded by the US and money. Now, the consequences has been disastrous. Of course, US has collapsed, which uh, probably is not what I'm talking about as much as I'm talking about refugee crisis and, and the impact aftermath, because these Mujahideen fighters then spread around the world in many parts of the world. So even what is happening in Russia, um, there, there is impact. So we, I, think my, uh, I think we cannot understand what's happening in the world today until we engage very deeply with the ramifications of what happened uh, in Afghanistan. And, uh, and uh, OK, so th Tajikistan was forced <laughs> independence, but Tajikistan exper experienced civil war. Why civil war? What happened? Why was there was no democracy and freedom? Because just because the Soviet Union collapsed, <coughs> does not mean that the Russian interest collapsed, right? The Soviet, uh, Russian army, and the Russian powerful economic political bloc 
supported the person that they trusted, Rahman, to capture state resources along with the northern elites that they trusted from this area. right? And these areas got left out, which includes Gorno Badakhshan. They were left out. So instead of investing in democratic uh, nation building, there was state capture. And that fight between the opposition and the, those who started governing the nation is what resulted into the civil war. Uh, again, uh, huge losses to people, uh, just 5 million people, but the losses comparatively are immense. OK, so we finished broader discourse of development, which is promoted by the US side. We looked at historical pattern and saw Soviet Union uh, trajectory that Soviet Union took, the, the watershed movement, and now Tajikistan today. OK. OK. So today's Tajikistan has about 9 million people. It's a very young country. About 22 is the median age. It's mostly rural population, 80% of it. But literacy rate is very high. So, it's, uh, so human capital seems to be quite in place. Uh, heavily dependent on remittance. So that shows the result of the Soviet policies, that it was not geared towards making them self-sufficient or or, or uh, rich enough uh, to look after themselves, but it was dependent on core economy elsewhere, right? So it's still dependent. Uh, and approximately 1 million young people every year migrate mainly to Russia looking for work. Most of them get labor work, menial work. Uh, and now Russia has uh, tightened its immigration policies. So now they're looking to go to work in South Korea, in, in other Gulf states. Um, heavily dependent on donor funding. Uh, that shows the state of autonomy that state might have. Diverse ethno-linguistic group. Uh, again, it's better not to treat these uh, figures as, uh, as uh, essentialized figures. Because who, who is constituted as Tajik? Who is considered as Uzbek? Those people themselves may identify themselves differently at times. So, so, uh, so these numbers are official numbers. 98% uh, Muslims, 95% uh, uh, Sunni, and about 5% Shia. So that's the kind of economic, socio-economic, cultural profile look like as of now. Now my focus is what happened to the economic. World Bank and USAID are at the helm of free trade transition, right? So they are the hegemonic actors here who are doing that transition for, for the. Now, Talco is the fourth largest aluminum smelter. Rahman, who is the head of Talco, is also the president for, for life. Uh, it generates 20% of Tajikistan's GDP. A lot of its electricity comes from heavy rationing across the country. So a lot of hospitals don't work because electricity is rationed out to this. Partnerships with, uh, with companies registered. So now transition to the global economy has meant, now this is based on investigative journalism. And Hitesho, Kuli, uh, and Hellman, their work is very, uh, the paper I'm writing will have all the references. I just had to take out here to not to clutter my slides. So my paper will have all the references. So who is the stakeholder here in offshore? So Norway's Hydro Aluminum is a stakeholder. And there are two other companies registered in British Island. What has happened now? It is no more a producer or exporter or of uh, uh, aluminum, but it is a subcontractor. Now the language has changed of representing what Talco does. Now it is a subcontractor. It's not a producer. It's not a processor. And the profit share, in 2005 to 2007, offshore companies received about 500 million, whereas Tajikistan received 15 million. So a huge 
part of the income actually is not going back to the Tajik state or its people. And according to the estimate, about 1.45 billion was lost in GDP to Tajik people uh, in 2007. And Tajikistan GDP, mind you, is only 3.7 billion, right? And 1.4 billion, billion is a huge chunk to be outside the country. And we know this because the court case came to London High Court. Why did court case come to London High Court? Because before, Talco was under the control of Rusal. And Rusal got pushed out, and new companies got in. And whoever were the stakeholders, uh, of course, there's conflict of interest. And the court case actually came to the British High Court, which declared not only this arrangement, but any prior arrangements as fraud. Now, what was World Bank's role in it? So according to Hitler Shah, World Bank actually mediated these transitions. It mediated these contracts, along with a European reconstruction uh, bank based in Europe. So that's one phase. Now, we often in Tejindra's module, we use two phases of education where Bush and Salterity Rally's work is discussed how two phases of education. Education can be driver of conflict. It can be driver of peace. But it's, I, 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 my problem with that work is it's very methodologically nationalistic, <coughs> Bush and Salterity's work. And we have lots of students then working and running with it. It's very methodologically nationalistic work because what's outside the frame is what outside the nation, right? And, and so, so the role of World Bank, I, 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 I'm right, uh, so there are two faces to these uh, huge banks. So one face is, is associated with offshore economy, but the other face, so now World Bank, how does it represent itself? It represents us as, as, as a champion of education in Central Asia. It's championing reform in particular. If, when you look at the reports and surveys produced by World Bank, that actually recommend Tajikistan's final poverty is an issue. It, is, it exists because people lack market skills. There is an issue of technical assistance. There is an issue of poor wages. There is lack of resources. There is inappropriate textbook. There is domestic corruption. But nowhere in World Bank documents it highlights that there are other aspects of the global economy that also are major causes of poverty. This is a typical document uh, published by World Bank. A key to economic and social progress is training of better qualified individuals. So they're not better qualified. They're not skilled. They're not enterprising. They're, they need to be more productive. So again, it comes from deficit framework that they don't have this. They need to have this. And then it will alleviate their poverty. And Rahman uh, portrays uh, young people who are unemployed as threat to stability in Tajikistan. Again, you can see this goes back to Truman's declaration that those who are poor are threat to themselves and to more prosperous areas. So that threat discussion continues in Rahman's discussion. World Bank, it highlights its documents that once in a year, the population fall below the poverty line but then it recommends that we need to uh, encourage the role of private sec sector as pro And it describes actually privatization as pro-poor policy, rather than state taking responsibility for people. Other documents published by World Bank actually says that you know, structural adjustment reforms would be very helpful to Tajikistan. There is a delay because of the civil war without any consideration what has been discussion around it in different other countries in the world. So there is a sense of not learning from the lessons derived from other contexts, at least in, in these documents. And meanwhile, Tajikistan's debt has, is exceeding. It's likely to be up to 70% uh, by the end of last year, according to a uh, uh, research. Um, now. World Bank document, now again we see ideological element here. It presents Soviet as backward, as outdated. 
and it uh, considers that uh, textbooks inherited from Soviet time should be the top priority. Those should be replaced and that should be top priority. Whereas it differs from uh, local MOE priorities. Anyway, uh, authoritarian stability as peace. So the issue of authoritarianism. Now the dominant discourse from, of, uh, from the government that stability is peace. It does not say absence of demo, uh, you know, absence of democratic processes is not a peace, you know. So, uh, so stability is what is promoted rather than any fundamental transformation of structures. It blames people for not understanding democracy. So the discussions are like, we are not ready for democracy. We are not prepared for democracy. So Rahman has to be there, paternalistically to look after people. Uh, what scholars argue, it's a global performance state. So it's not really a state, but it's performing as a state. And it's strategically performed to international audience in particular, uh, so that it retains legitimacy to receive international aid. And the opposition is loyal opposition. So for example, this 2030 election was really funny because Nowhere Rahman said that he was campaigning for election, but on the media he was everywhere doing what? Opening schools, opening factories, doing charity works. So he was known campaigning. And the opposition candidates campaigned urging citizens to vote for the most suitable candidate, which is actually a slogan of the party of Rahman. And most of the opposition has been killed, exiled, persecuted, imprisoned. And whatever remains is actually a loyal opposition. So that does the campaigning for Rahman, whereas Rahman does development. And schools and media present Rahman as having trans. Now look at the representation. Now Rahman is present, uh, being represented that Tajikistan was underdeveloped country. Now it has become developing country. And it's all due to the efforts of Rahman. He is a national hero. He is a peace warrior. What happens to the international aid? It goes to supporting Rahman's own military capacity. The US's aid is linked with securitizing Afghan border and drug traffic trafficking. China's uh, is linked with securitizing Uyghur uh, population which border Tajikistan. So there is international aid, but it's very much connected with military agendas. And all these things don't exist. So UN led peace agreement priority security agenda, but not truth and reconciliation, not crimes committed uh, during the war. Whatever argument, whatever programs were there to support good governance or legal reform or civil society, they have been closed because there is lack of investment. And also the disarmament and promoting democracy kind of United Nations office, they have also been closed. Now the third thing, nationalism and geopolitics. There is a clear portrayal of broader geopolitical relations reflecting in the nationalism, nationhood discourse in education. So textbooks portray the Arabs as invaders uh, who conquered and Islamized the country. The Tajik national subject is presented as Aryan. He's an a so Tajik are Aryan civilization, like Russians. <coughs> Russians are saviors. So there is racial uh, and linguistic proximity. And very clearly, uh, the, the, the curriculum is, is not something you can call cool that can contribute to peace building. So the idea of superior race, purity, supremacy, aristocracy, pure blood, that were uh, that are cycled around Aryan civilization ideology are recycled here. Iran's case is really interesting because Tajikistan has very close. Uh, Tajikistan speaks most of the people speak East Iranian languages. Uh, it has very close historical shared uh, cultural 
and literary tradition going across Iran and Tajikistan. So when Tajikistan became independent, elites and intellectuals were very enthusiastic to rebuild connection with their historical Iran, broader Iranian past, so which was very much privileged, very valued. After 9-11, Iran is seen as a threat. There is a distance from Iran. And, uh, and uh, in fact, opposition that is exiled, they have found refuge in Iran now. So there is, uh, there is so nationalism is very much connected with broader geopolitical interest. Tsar's uh, conquests justifies as bringing progress. And if, they in, uh, if Russians inflicted any violence, it's because uh, Uzbek and Turkic people made them do so. So that's the portrayal in, in, in textbooks. Anyway, but we get the idea. Uh, the exalted Tajik national subject is modeled after Sukhd region, which is the richest region. In, in Tajikistan. So you can clearly see that the area which is the richest, their culture, their history, and their language, and their portrayal is considered as normal for the whole Tajik, is seen as the real Tajik culture. So, and this has a lot of implication for the minorities within who do not identify themselves as Sogdians. Good Muslim, bad Muslim identity. USAID was the major donor for community peace building. It was promoting community peace building uh, in 2007, but now it does economic prosperity. Uh, the focus has shifted. But, uh, but there is a clear tailoring of religion, of what is good Islam and what is not good Islam. And clearly, we can see it's connected with even donor agenda. And now, in fact, in recent speech of Rahman, women are asked to actually monitor their own husbands and brothers and children. So women have special responsibility to ensure that they bring up good Muslims uh, and monitor any activities that don't fit into good Muslim criteria. So even now, women have become bearer of a securitization agenda. Now, Gurno Badakshan, now all these big story that I just did, uh, where, what, what's happening to Gorno Badakhshan? So Gorno Badakhshan, of course, after the uh, end of uh, Soviet Union, there was, uh, you can see there is economic aspiration, there is aspiration to be part of the political game. Uh, it also declared its independence from Tajikistan briefly, uh, but it didn't go down very well. Uh, now, uh, Gorno Badakhshan is important to Tajikistan because it covers 45% land area. It's also a transit route to Afghanistan, to China, to uh, India, to Pakistan. So from trade perspective, it's an extremely important area. 95% of GBS population is represented by Shia Ismaili Muslim, which is a 3% population of the country. Most of them do not speak Tajik as a first language, but they speak a variety of languages like Yazgulami, Wakhi, Sheena, uh, different languages. During the Civil War, it was in the opposition. And because the food supply was blocked during the Civil War, there was famine. And it's a remote area. It's one of the poor, it's actually the poorest region in Tajikistan. Uh, most of it is mountainous. And the Akkadian entered as a faith-based civil society to bring relief and food to people. And then it helped settle refugees, and it also uh, laid a disarmament uh, in Gorno Badakhshan. And the Aga Khan visited uh, in the middle of civil war to ask people not to fight against the Russian army, not to fight against the Tajik Rahman's army, but rather this was the declaration of the Aga Khan that that it will ask its Pamiri followers to whom it has uh, control over, like our authority over from religious symbolic perspective. It will ask them to actually support Rahman and side with the dominant party and join as, as a united citizenry. So the discourse is couched from development perspective. 
You see, so the entire authority is imagined from the perspective of development that AKDN is here for poverty eradication. It's here to support people to develop. It normalizes political docility, global market-based sensibilities, uh, passive pluralistic ideas, Western-centric idea, and securitized good Muslim identity. So that's the argument I'm making, that it creates a securitized good Muslim identity. Uh, and it has peace education, its own peace education that has been introduced, which draws uh, verses from the Quran and history to talk about uh, how tolerance and pluralism is our tradition, has been always our tradition. So pluralism is invented as, as a tradition that goes back right from 1400 years. And, and every Ismaili is supposed to be a peaceful ambassador of Islam. Market-based education is also offered so that people develop skills uh, to survive in global economy. English language is also taught. Uh, Western-centric education, there is clear uh, announcement that they really need to learn education which teaches English, which teaches how to survive in, in more westernized economies. So you do see this sensibility is being promoted through the discourse. Now my argument here is that it's aligning with the dominant discourses of development and the dominant actors because it's disciplined into it. So historically the community has a history of persecution. The Aga Khan, those people that Aga Khan traces ancestry with, those people have been either assassinated, exiled, killed, uh, all on the name of, because it's a claim to authority. It's claim to true custodian of faith uh, at one point, right? So, so you have this history of, uh, of uh, on the question of who owns particular population or particular uh, region of being, uh, being threatened and killed. And the Aga Khan was actually a refugee in the British Empire. So you have this refugee being a refugee and therefore you work with the dominant power that you are a refugee with. Uh, even communities have been annihilated often historically, even today in many parts of the world, it's, uh, it, it uh, suffers uh, consequences like genocide, massacre, or even uh, being part of the war. Alone in 20th century, because the community is uh, spread in 25 different countries, there are series of displacement and refugee crisis. The community's sensibilities are very much shaped by being a refugee. You are sometime refugee from East Africa, then you settle in the West, then you have in Afghanistan, you have in Tajikistan, then you have Myanmar, then you have. So, so there is a constant uh, displacement happening here or there. So, uh, so if you trace Ismailis, uh, you would also see their traces, uh, the networks of refugees and displaced that they would have friends or colleagues or relatives uh, who, who are caught up in this. Okay, so, and there is highly unequal access to freedom and dignity that they would experience. So, for example, in parts of uh, Gilgit Baltistan, which is part of disputed Kashmir, they do not have full citizenship. Whereas in Canada, uh, they are also part of the parliament. So, you have very highly unequal access to freedom and uh, access to sources for well being. In Tajikistan, Pamiri fighters dissenting against uh, Rahman are portrayed as terrorists and militants. And in parts of Tajikistan, uh, Ismailis are portrayed as Shia extremists. So you do have, and state surveillance uh, is, uh, so all the guidance and uh, religious education that the Aga Khan, through Aga Khan goes, is, is surveillance, it goes through surveillance. Okay, so Pamiri people, very quickly, when I met them, they demonstrated very, a very, very highly effective sense of belonging to being Pamiri. So that identity is the most uh, close to their heart. And that, that's what they're very attached to. Towards the state, uh, there is a relationship of suspicion. There is a relationship which is pragma pragmatically formed. 
and there is a rela there is a sense of disappointment uh, where people do not believe that their interest and uh, interest of the national capital Dushanbe match uh, they do not believe <laughs> that uh, market economy is working for them uh, they do not believe that military uh, has their interest in the heart it protects uh, Rahman not them um, and they ha and a lot of reason for their discontent is the long-term employment. Uh, women's agency, which was, uh, they, what they told me that it was higher during the Soviet time, but now it has, uh, in fact, uh, reduced, and women are taking up domestic role because there are no job opportunities or public opportunities for women. Uh, teachers are also becoming traders due to impoverishment. There is severe economic, in many uh, villages, there is no money trickling in hardly any money trickling in. Uh, they also have concerns for food, uh, climate change, because it's one of the areas which is adversely affected with climate change. Uh, and opium production has arisen, and even opium addiction has risen due to lack of medicine, lack of uh, uh, fuel during the winter, and lack of employment. Now the golden age is the Soviet rule. That's modern, that's civilization. What we have now is not freedom, it's colonization. What we have now is backward step. So they're very concerned about the gains that according to them they had main, main, uh, made during the Soviet time. So they do talk about uh, very positively, especially older generation and the adults uh, to uh, the, uh, the middle, you know, 40, uh, 30, 40 onwards, they do talk about Soviet was better, it was modern, it was, and now we have regressed. So that sense is there. Uh, but participants also seem pragmatic about their options. So a lot of them just think we need to just get on with what we have. Uh, past never comes. And that hardship then strengthens Aga Khan's authority. So religion is not something that exist as like, oh, it's a primordial love for it, but it develops in relation to the broader economic, political environment. So Aga Khan, uh, a lot of people describe to me Aga Khan as the savior. A lot of people say that because of him, we are alive. Otherwise, we don't know what would have happened to us. <coughs> so then religion becomes an identity uh, through which there is a sense of hope. Uh, OK. so. My conclusion is overall global, national, and local discourses uh, actually do not help uh, any fundamental structural transformation. And the solution is, of course, a lot of scholars have argued that political accountability for doing justice is important. Trade justice, the way trade operates, global economy <coughs> operates, debt relief, microcredit, safety network, unlearning that uh, and learning to learn from people who are actually marginalized and treating them that they have solutions rather than they are suspect and greater understanding of our own personal complicity uh, in, in, in the problems we are trying to address. So I think some of the solutions that I have, uh, I have is actually I have picked up from, my, uh, from academics and uh, uh, colleagues that have already written about. Um, and there is an extraordinary role of social scientists that what we talk, how we discussed uh, development, peace, and education. And one of the things that I felt uh, quite upset about while, while reading through all the reports, surveys, and books uh, on, because a lot of reports are not, uh, are actually either funded by agencies that I would benefit. Uh, so, so recommendations like, so for example, one of the very prominent academic who is based on a, a prominent European organization describes the situation uh, the way I did, but then recommendation is, look, it's so grim situation that now Europe has to actually uh, establish democracy there, send their army there, and actually take a control. So, so some of the research is done from that perspective that there is problem there. We need to go and do something to them. OK, so I'll stop there, and I'll take questions now. Thank you. A lot to digest.
Um, I suggest we take three questions at one go, and then you know we take another round. We've got about um, 20 minutes uh, to get some insight. So, who wants to have a go first? Sorry, I think I really spoke a bit more than I should have. They're, they're absorbing the you know, huge amount of knowledge you share. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, uh, sh okay, so that's no, one question. There's another question, that's fine, carry on with that. Shall we take more, or? Is there another point? Somebody who has other questions to ask? Thank you, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I think it's a good question, and, and uh, because I think I have a lot more, uh, I didn't go over all the slides. Uh, it's complicated for me, what he's doing, and what, uh, <coughs> A, there is this humanitarian idea that we need to reach out to people and save them. So that does exist, right? But then, is this helping to transform the situation? Is it addressing the global root causes of problems? No, it's not, right? So it's, it's dealing, it's picking up the pieces and dealing with what you can do. And I actually was last uh, month, uh, actually in November, I was a, a, in, a, in a conference where the from the Pamiri side, the person who had participated in, in, in representing the Pamiri community, that they should disarm themselves and join Tajikistan and become you know, pa pa you know, part of the Tajikistan. So the person who represented Pamiri community, I asked him and he said, we are aware, but we're only doing what we can. You know? so, so, so what we can do is basically that liberal humanist notion that let's provide them skills, let's provide them education, and then they will just survive somewhere, somehow in global economy. Uh, but at the same time, it also generates local forms of solidarities, because the state is not taking responsibility for health or education or basic safety network or microcredit. It does that. So in some sense, it is compensating for the state and providing these facilities to people so that they have some resources to go on with. So I hope it makes sense that it, it it's it's more complex than one role. But I'm just curious, I mean, in terms of uh, education, I assume that was one of the overarching interests of your lecture. Yeah, um, so they funded uh, establishment of University of Central Asia, <coughs> uh, especially programs around mountainous society development. Um, but these are mainly how to cope with the climate changes and the global neoliberal economy. And, and still, r so idea of resilience, that you can't change the root cause of the problem, but you be resilient about it. So that kind of discourse is found in, in, in universities that's established. Also, it has established network of private schools, uh, low-fee private schools. But again, uh, how many people have access to m money a lot of the villages money is not trickling in. Yes, I mean, what, do you, what do you think an organization like Aga Khan or similar organizations striving <coughs> to do development work in Tajikistan and other places like Yukon should and could do differently given the constraints um, to be more effective and to change the narrative from... That's such a good question. I think we should ask uh, my my mentors here, uh, like Moses and Elaine and, you know, like our more, our more senior colleagues here who teach about. So please do help me because I don't know the answer. Because as I said, uh, it's disciplined into speaking the language of the dominant discourse. Otherwise, it's presented as terrorist. And it could be potentially very harmful to its own existence. So one thing I would like to highlight that it does change the narrative, uh, opens up the narrative a little bit more than economic centric, because it does talk about how, how do you reach out to each other. So for, for example, the question is, it's not about what have I achieved, but what am I helping other people to achieve as well. So there is a, there is a local form of solidarities that are being encouraged, 
which I think the local grassroots solidarity is also important. To that extent, I think Acadian is complicit in the global structures of violence. It's also a victim of that global structure of violence, but it is also at very grassroots level resisting some of it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then you reference the World Bank, right, which is mostly talking about TIBET, like technical assistance to the Um And then also, you know, you have USAID, uh, Bureau of Population, Refugee, and Migration, which is also funding similar TIBET programs as well as the European Commission. Um, and so I'm wondering, of all these various donors, where are you seeing divergences in their desired outcomes and objectives? Um, whereas, you know, <coughs> some of like the more Western, uh, Western donors are focusing on TIBET, Yeah, yeah. And also a technical education and learning English language, uh, and also scholarship to learn and study in Western higher education institution. Uh, and the other civil society actors, uh, many of them are involved in different niche areas. So one works uh, on disability and inclusiveness, another works on global citizenship education, <coughs> another works on providing shelter, like Save the Children works on providing shelter, and other works on providing resources in the library. But all these organizations, when I was looking at what they actually do is dealing with the situation as it is, but then rather than transforming the situation. I think that's, yeah. More questions? Yes, go ahead. Please. Yeah, so I'll just pick up that final point there. So you put a transforming situation, I mean, those those, those bilateral or multilateral agencies are operating at state level. So they, they're, not, they're not in a position, I mean, I accept all of the points that you're making, yeah. right? they're not in a position to, to transform yeah. anything that's against the, uh, specifically against the interests of, yeah. the, of, the, of the government. So yeah. You wouldn't expect yeah. that, would you? Yeah, and that's what I think broadly I want to say, that this is how broader discourses of education are situated in Tajikistan, where you have hegemonic discourse of neoliberal market economy that's coming from all these organizations. Um, and that's what has become hegemonic even in Tajikistan, just the way it's in, in many different parts of the world. And yeah, I think the point I'm want, wanting to make is this is what has become normalized way of development, rather than talking about some other fundamental aspects of equities and poverty and conflict. Yeah. So I agree with you in that sense that this is what has become a normal way of practices for the civil society. I hope it makes sense. Yeah. These practices have been normalized. That's what I want to say. That I agree with you that this is the role they're not supposed to play of transforming and remain where they are. But this is, this is how this has been normalized. It could have been different. There could be other ways of doing development. But this is what is normalized. I just wondered what these vulnerabilities looked like and how they played out uh, across the particular cultures. I, I wasn't sure what was happening there with regard to who was benefiting and uh, who, who was not with regard to those sorts of um, measures. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think the focus of my research is mainly about what are the broader discourses and national discourses and what is civil society, how is civil society positioned in it, and what people respond in relation to that. So it's not really engaging deeply with uh, what are the different patterns of vulnerab vulnerability and well-being. So that wasn't really my focus. Uh, 
so what I can say it from how they think about their political engagement. So they feel that they are not, their voice is not heard. What do they think about their economic uh, opportunities? They feel that they have to migrate and fit into global economy wherever opportunity because they are not there in Tajikistan. Uh, so, so my objective was to look at how do they locate themselves in relation to political, economic, and cultural sense. So that aspect is what was my consideration. So unfortunately, I'm not able to discuss more in terms of different facets of well-being. Mm -hmm. No, that's interesting. Yeah. So the vulnerability but the yeah. political sense of kind of lack of voice and lack yeah. of lack yeah. of yeah. a sense of um, being forced to move far from places yeah. where you'd rather yeah. be. So those sorts of yeah. ideas are getting yeah. 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 That's a good question. Now, <coughs> when I spoke to my participants, it seemed like because the U Soviet had uh, very much emphasized gender equality and universal education, so women uh, were uh, had access to education during the Soviet time. Women ve played a very active role in, in, in the economic uh, 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 arena. Uh, a lot of them were teachers mainly. A lot of them were in the medical facilities. A lot of them were typists or in those kind of role. So you see women were situated in more those kind of roles, typist, clerical roles, uh, teacher, uh, medical, uh, during the Soviet time. But you see universal literacy at that time, and uh, you see uh, a sense of the discourse that had promoted equality. But now, uh, that's one of their concerns. Because, uh, and, and in fact, when I was in Korok, most of the shops, uh, the street shops were, ra ra were run by uh, the women. So women were very actively, uh, as you can see, you will see mostly women in the shop, in the market. So actually they became, whereas men, I saw a lot of them actually sitting on the street, uh, or, my, uh, or a lot of them had migrated, but women were the one who started shops and who started selling goods, who started going across the bridge to Afghanistan to exchange goods. So you see them taking market economic uh, roles available to them. But research also suggests that uh, a lot of women, because they're limited, the economy also gets saturated, how many women can come out and, and sell, sell good on the street like that. So a lot of women are sitting back at home because not many women also travel across uh, the world to look for work. So many of the women have uh, gone back and taking more, uh, more uh, what is considered as a traditional role. Uh, and a lot of teachers are also giving up a uh, job because of uh, not sufficient funding in teaching profession and taking up trade. Yeah. Very cool. Can I just follow up on that as well? So the, we've got women working in these spaces here, being back at home. We've got men sitting on the street, you said. I mean, I'm just what the, the at least at that time. At that time. Big, yeah. At and is it the men then who are moving up away and migrating as well? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so because it's a mountainous society, uh, there are not enough opportunities. There are NGOs, but which are mainly in Korog. So in little villages and towns, there, there are hardly much NGO presence as well. So trade is one option. But uh, there are no factories or no uh, office works, so a lot of uh, areas actually do not have those economic opportunities. Now, country of nine million has up to one and one and a half million young people actually traveling abroad, and remittance is the major uh, source of GDP, is the major source of earning. Um, up to 70% or something according to one figure actually comes from remittance money even in Gornobadakshan, not locally. And is the sense of what sitting at home or sitting in the street leads to? 
Um, that's, that's a good question because uh, at the moment, OPM addiction on, is on rise and it also leads to a sense of discontentment among many young people. And many young people don't feel happy, don't feel satisfied, don't feel that they have any opportunities where they are. Uh, there is a lot of <laughs> frustration there. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rose. Um, I'm interested in the curriculum. So you mentioned in the slide that there was, sorry if I misunderstood, non-Wahhabi, non-Salafi yeah. type um, agenda from the government. Yeah. Um, in Iraq, I do not know the numbers, but there have been several women, especially from Tajikistan, yeah. who are presently um, sentenced to death, as far as I'm aware. So yeah. I'm interested if there's like a, so the government has some sort of agenda and it backfires. Could you just tell me a bit more about yeah, the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, a lot of critic, it's, it's about 97% population of the country, uh, or 98% population of the country identifies themselves with Islam, right? And, when, and a lot of uh, critique of the government is then expressed by many people using Islamic slogan, right? So it becomes one way to gather, one way to mobilize, one way to express your dissent, one way to express uh, hope. So religion become, uh, in that way becomes very important part of uh, then mobilizing even critique against. And so one, one of the reasons that good Muslim, bad Muslim discourse is also playing on those that people should not gather around no, no, using name of religion, that's one. B, a lot of young people who work in Russia, uh, Russia has tightened its immigration policy. There are many women as well. Uh, and they mainly fit into the bottom, tend to be like labor worker or more, more uh, bottom rung of uh, economies. And some of them have gone to fight with ISIS. So some of them have gone to Iraq or Syria uh, for different causes and some of them are women as well so it's much more complex in much more complex way the Russian security agenda the Rahman security agenda the US security agenda uh, it's all pl also playing but it's also global neoliberal economy also playing into their movements and their discontent and then religion kind of cross cuts in all these discourses does it make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. Um, yeah. I've seen some books in Iraq yeah. where um, things are written in Arabic, but yeah. it is not the original Arabic. It's been edited. And there's no uh, publisher, and there's no name of and relatively new books. Mm -hmm. So a prayer, but it is completely different to the original Arabic. And one of the thing is Saudi, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is still funding. Okay. Uh, so there is Saudi Arabia <coughs> fund, which is looked at suspiciously, but Saudi Arabia's fund also goes uh, through non-official channels. Uh, so as Said says that different cultural, political, and economic agendas use cultural discourses to their own advantage. You can see that playing <coughs> upon people's grievances. You can see that playing upon how the uh, situation is structured at the moment. Thank you. Understanding the complexity of development uh, historically, but also the competing narratives of development. So it's quite interesting to gain some knowledge and insight uh, from this part of the world and the critical work that my colleague uh, Dr. Sadiwan is doing. So thank you for sharing with us. I think we have <coughs> come to the end, uh, and I would um, say that if you still want to explore yeah. this rich knowledge and rich ideas, please have a chat with her. Thank you for coming to the state seminars. We host these seminars you know, every now and then to share this kind of rich knowledge. It's free of charge, uh, at least I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, of course, at the point of view, the door is open, we don't charge you. Uh, but uh, it all happens because of my colleague, uh, William, who makes sure that you yeah. know, we have a room, we have the chairs, and we have this advertised and uh, on event price. So thank you, William, for uh, providing the platform for my colleague to share his ideas. So if you're not registered with us, uh, please, uh, you can leave your email if you're willing with William, and then you know, you'll always get an update whenever we have a seminar series. So thank you again for sharing the knowledge. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thanks for the good questions. Is there yeah. any way I can get the slides?
Yeah. If I send yeah. you an email. Uh, yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That was really cool. It's, it's a little bit uh, long, so I'm uh, interested in history. So for me, it's okay. Like, yeah. All right. But but it, it sometimes server seems to reject it. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So I hope I can send you the link. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Great. You stayed back. No, Thank you. I stayed. I wanted to listen and enjoy, but I'm Thank going you. to my research meeting now. Sure. Yeah. In this region, what are some of the things that you would suggest that you've learned from? Yeah, no. Yeah. 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 Yeah.